Good afternoon. I'm Chantal Adams, the student counselor at the Western Cape campus, and I'd like to welcome you to our online event today, specifically for our College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences students. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, the senior counselor, Ms. Sonia Barnard. Um, you would have seen our program and we have a, a number of uh, speakers and guests from our college from the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences um, to Consumer Sciences, Forensic um, Geosciences, Geography, um, as well as um, one of our own trainee career guidance practitioner. And we'll be speaking about agricultural careers. And we hope that you find today's discussion and engagements meaningful. Um, I've included in the chat function the attendance registers and contact details of the student counsellors in the Western Cape, and you're welcome to make contact with us. I've also included links to the attendance register and evaluation form. I'd like to welcome all our speakers. I see some of our speakers in the audience today. Um, welcome to our program of events and then also just a welcome and thank you to our technical support Mr Mubashir Karbere. Um, so before we start off with the events um, I just want to check with the senior councillor Ms Sonia Barnard would you like to say hello to everyone? Good afternoon to all attendees. Uh, Chantal and I are quite excited to host this career event. It's the first for this college and I know it's UNISA's smallest college but it's incidentally also the college that punches way above its weight in terms of master and doctoral students. And we'd really want to nurture talent in our province and across the country when it comes to agriculture and environmental sciences. It is our survival um, in our country is dependent on students preparing for careers in that area. So I hope you enjoy the afternoon. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I think um, from seeing all the presentations, I think the the important points that stand out for me and why it is important to connect with our students in this college is around um, topics such as uh, food shortages, um, the importance of um, geomapping. Um, I'm not someone that even managed to complete geography until matric. I think those were one of, that is one of the subjects that I dropped out. I didn't really have the aptitude for it. But um, now as an adult, I do understand the importance um, when I when I look through the presentation, the importance of food security, water security, um, the importance of labs and testing that needs to be done. Um, and so putting together this event has really also opened up my mind and expanded my knowledge base. So I hope that our students also find the topics and the talks engaging and stimulating. Any questions that arise from any of the presentations today, any concerns, anything new that comes up, you're welcome to um, email the student counselors if you'd like to um, speak directly perhaps to one of the speakers. We can always put you in contact or you can send us a list of your questions for clarification. Um, and so we're really wanting today to connect with our students and open up the, the line of communication so that we stimulate conversations around this important field. So without further ado, our first um, speaker for, the, for today, Ms. Nunsa Tabeta from UNISA, um, the topic discovering your career goals through the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Namsa Tavete, and I am the lecturer in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. My talk is about discovering new career goals through the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. I will start by sharing my career journey and the qualifications that I have obtained thus far. I have completed the National Diploma and BTEC in Environmental Health at the Tiny University of Technology. I then completed the BSc in Environmental Management at the University of South Africa. I then completed two master's degrees, one in Environmental Health at the Tiny University of Technology and the other in Epidemiology at the University of Pretoria. I am currently studying towards a PhD in Public Health at the University of the Witwatersrand. 
I started working in 2006 at the Mpumalanga Department of Health as the Community Service Environmental Health Practitioner. I was then appointed as a Senior Environmental Health Practitioner by Gavan Beke Municipality in 2006. And in 2014, I joined Hersivan, the district municipality, as a senior air quality officer. And in 2019, I was appointed as the lecturer at the University of South Africa. My field of interest is in air pollution and associated health effects. There are quite a number of career opportunities available for students in the field of agriculture and environmental sciences. And I will not go through the entire list. I hope my presentation will be shared with you upon a request. Just to mention a few career opportunities that are available for the students in the field of agriculture and environmental sciences. You can be an environmental specialist, technician, consultant or scientist. You can be an ecologist. You can be a toxicologist. You can be a town planner. You can be a nursery manager and so on. There are myths associated with working in the field of agriculture and environmental sciences. People believe that we always need to work outdoors all the time. This is not true. We do a lot of work in our offices, in laboratories, etc. And we are not always outdoors. They say everyone can be an environmentalist. Not entirely true. You still need to op obtain relevant qualifications in order for you to be a qualified environmentalist. They say environmental work is a passion, not a profession. Of course, it is a passion, but it is still a profession. So we are professionals who have a passion in the environment. Formal education and experience is not necessary in the environment. This is not true. You need formal education. You need to be trained as an environmentalist in order to be an environmental expert. They say it's a male-dominated field. This is not true. I'm one of the females who is working in the field of agriculture and environmental sciences. And there are quite a number of females that I am working with. They say agriculture is only for farmers. I am not a farmer, but I am still working in the field of agriculture. There are quite a number of opportunities that are available in this field. And that does not mean you only need to be a farmer. They say it takes little or no education to be an environmentalist, agriculturist, or horticulturist. This is not true. You need to obtain the qualifications still. And above all, they say there's no room for growth. Believe me, there's so much growth in this world. You can be a researcher, you can be an agricultural economist, you can be a lecturer, you can be an environmental aspect, and so on. I am also going to share with you how to prepare yourself to be a successful student in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. You need to complete all your assignments and submit the assignments on or before the due date. Don't be afraid to contact your lecturer and ask questions. This is very important. You need to practice time management. I've seen so many times how I struggle to maintain the balance on work, studies, and family. Always save your draft assignments in multiple places. I had an experience where I only saved my assignment in a USB, and unfortunately, I lost that USB. So I had no assignment to submit. So it is very much important that you save your assignment in multiple places. Even email the assignment to yourself if you can. Understand the importance of the syllabus and refer back to it throughout the semester. This is very much important. You need to know what is expected for you to learn for a particular module so that you don't spend your time studying stuff that is not relevant to the module that you're studying for. Don't let your social life take priority over your academic life. I know so many times you're invited to parties, weddings, and brother showers, and so on you might have to send an apology in order for you to study. You need to know your lecturer. UNISA has many lecturers and so many times I get emails from students regarding the modules that I'm not even responsible for. 
you need to know your lecturers very well and know which lecturer teaches which module. Continuing with how to prepare yourself to be a successful student in the College of Agriculture, you need to know the resources that are available to you through your library. You need to find a study group. It is very difficult to study alone. We all need that little motivation. If you have a group of people that you study with, you'll be encouraged to even study more. You need to get organized. Diarize all the due dates for your assignment. Don't multitask. So many times we want to do certain things while we're studying. Even studies have shown that multitasking is physically impossible. If you are studying, focus on your studies and leave the rest. Divide your work into manageable portions. You don't need to study the whole 15 chapters at once. Divide your work. Know when to stop. You need to sleep enough. So many times we underestimate the importance of sleeping. If you don't sleep enough, you will not be focused. Set a study schedule. You need to know the days when you will be studying and from what time till what time. It is also very important to take notes while you're studying so that you can always refer to the important point to the important points when you are doing revision. Talking about the funding opportunities that are available for the students in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, just to mention a few, the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries has a bursary for both undergraduate and postgraduate students. The local and provincial government has bursaries as well. There are international and national research uh, foundation scholarships that are available for our students. The Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, including the National Association for Clean Air, has bursaries available for both undergraduate and postgraduate students. And of course, UNISA has a bursary that is available for you know, both the undergraduate and postgraduates. There are quite a number of fields that you can specialize on in the field of agriculture and environmental sciences, including the Achilles. You can specialize in air quality and become an air quality expert. You can specialize in climate change and become a climate change scientist. You can uh, specialize in biodiversity and become a biodiversity aspect and so on. This brings me to the end of my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, much Ms. Nomsa Tabita. I think um, what I found really interesting was uh, demystifying the field, um, understanding and opening the the floor to different types of conversations, you know, that it's not only farming, the field is not only for men, um, they, there's not only one career in the field, there are other career opportunities, and also just opening our minds to the, the other possibilities in terms of career options in this field. Um, and then she also spoke about what it, what it takes to be a successful distance learner, scheduling, planning, time management, but also very importantly, self-management and prioritizing. Um, I'm sure that our students will find the information regarding the funding beneficial. I know we always have requests from students needing more and more information around funding due to the limited uh, funding opportunities for our students. So I hope that our students uh, make use of the resources and the information that is shared today in the presentations. All the students that uh, registered to attend uh, today's event will receive a copy of the recording. And the students who have joined, you're welcome to leave your comments, um, questions, concerns in the chat function for this event. Our next speaker, um, is Ms. Nellin Corsi, also from UNISA, the Department of Life and Consumer Sciences, and her topic title is Consumer Science Shedding Light. Good morning, everyone. My name is Corsi. I am from the Department of Life and Consumer Science with the campus. I mainly teach uh, food service and beverage in the food stream within the department. I'm quite excited this morning to be sure. 
detail why cause out of all qualifications out there and also include skill set as well as career opportunities in the field. Thank you. My next slide is going to be telling why consumer science is in a planning institution or context. You already know that UNISA is open distance learning where there is a fan between a lecturer as well as well that not affect you as a student into underperforming or low of yourself. Instead, it should trigger to think big on use your skills to change your self-development and affecting your communities. I am saying this because I know that the students are they, they are critically aware of learning. They are critically aware of mental needs. They are in they are resilient and responsible to deadlines on time. Then to apply uh, knowledge that they have gained through studies that are in the working environment affecting their communities. Before I move and I would like to to, to show that I normally need healthy thing in their bodies. Well, please allow me to say science qualification is very important in our societies. Of course, with the of creativity as well as in one may add a, a vibrant, impactful, and extra in the consumer sciences world. With that being to say, consumer sciences highlight a need to be created the benefits of consumers. I normally define consumers as a diverse discipline that focus on as aspect of human needs. It explores an individual in relation to food in relation as well as clothing. As I've said, consumer science call it very important in our society. Uh, our consumer science, they have the unique that they play or they're unique in the communities. They think from my previous slide, the important unique role that is playing consumer scientists in community, society, or in environment. It is important that consumer needs are ever-changing, they are, they are increasing, uh, that it is important for a consumer science student to be well updated, keeping up with the knowledge in meeting of those consumers. It is important to, to highlight that they have a unique role in different sectors. Just to mention that our students contribute to clothing and textile with their unique design. They contribute to food service management as food and nutrition. Nutrition at the community level, nutrition in a company level that offers nutrition. We do not register with HPSA. Consumer Science Nutrition Qualification, okay? We also contribute to hospitality and tasks, focusing on those that directly affect the certification as well as high-level services. Our Consumer Science Qualification a unique dynamic curriculum allows our students to form part of an ever-growing research whereby our students, they become food, food product developers, some manage food, food, food operations, some in market food product spaces, as well as food production companies. My next slide will cover set alignment as well as transfer of skills. It is important to note that applications are not solely disciplinary, but they encompass of applicable skills, hard skills, and work in learning. Altogether, it enhances the ability of our students. We have consumer sciences in food service, in hospitality management, in fashion, as well as clothing and 
We also offer a quality of theory and practical modules. For, we have a full preparation practical, which is being our third year students. Uh, one of the things there is food preparation technique, sensory evaluation, menu planning, as well as serving of food. For example, completing a food service applications, our students are able in a division of quality in a food product training or processing company. Additionally, consumer science qualification has working modules. For example, we have applied food and beverage project, which is offered to 10 year students. Uh, skills that they obtain the national functions in food safety is culling, is food beverage management, marketing of food product. For example, after being a hospitality management qualification, students are employable industries such as guest houses, tailors, as well as rest. Skills fed through practical components where students are given uh, food practical manuals, they are required videos as well as submit their assessment for, for, for report for Thank you, Ms. Uh, Nalin Kosi spoke about um, four very important uh, focus areas, uh, the importance of uh, food industry, clothing, hospitality, and also um, motivating our students to engage and become part of the research community. Um, she spoke a lot about the, the qualifications and very important for consumer science students to know um, and understand that the half of the qualification is theory, but a large part of it is practical and does include work integrated learning. So students also need to think about how and what types of uh, companies and organizations and where they could complete the uh, work integrated learning and think about these companies who are allowing them to do the work integrating. Um, scan their environment and reflect on what types of career opportunities um, can become available to you in future as you plan for your future career and what would the next step be. So one is always planning for, um, yes, wanting to secure your first place of employment, but once you do get your foot in the door, one continues planning for what would be my next step? What would be my next move? Which company would I want to move to? Um, which skills would I want to transfer? And what skills do I need to equip myself to be successful in this field? Our next speaker, um, we're going to, um, we meant to have a, a presentation by Professor Peter Smith, um, but we have to skip that one because he's not available at the moment. So we're moving on to the next speaker, Sibu uh, Sisu Malendisa, um, a lecturer also for the College of Agriculture and PhD candidate as well. And his topic is titled From Genetics to Drug Discovery, My Journey in Academia and Research. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sibu Sisu Malendisa, and today I'll be talking to you about my journey in academia and research. Before I begin, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Ms. Chantal Adams and her team for inviting me to present to you today. It is an honor to be presenting to you to today. Appreciate the opportunity. So like I've said, my name is Busiso Malindisa, and I'm going to talk to you today about my journey in academia from genetics to drug discovery. I hope you'll find this as interesting as I do. So who is Busiso? So I was born in Davidson, uh, in the east of Johannesburg, Eguruleni, a small township. And um, I am currently a PhD candidate uh, in the Department of Life and Consumer Sciences uh, at the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences here at UNISA. Not only do I do that, I am also a lecturer of biotechnology. So I'm just going to briefly talk to you about um, how I started my journey. 
So I matriculated in 2009 at Huluazi Secondary School uh, in Daviton, and I got a bachelor's pass, so I was eligible to um, start a, to, to go to university for a bachelor's degree. So that was me there, right there in red. Um, so this was just a picture we took the final day of our metric uh, and with a couple of friends. So um, in terms of my career, um, I've always wanted to be within the medical field. I've always enjoyed life sciences uh, as a subject uh, in, in school. And so I naturally gravitated towards being a medical doctor. And not only that, but also my parents and my teachers uh, around saw that, uh, you know, I am very good in life sciences. Um, so I should really consider a career as a medical doctor. So that uh, was something that was engraved in me as a young child. So then it's something that I also uh, enjoyed uh, with time because uh, finding out the causes of disease and how the body works uh, in general, um, how do we interact with the plants and bacteria and all of that was uh, very interesting to me. So I thought, you know, growing up, you only have really four career options that you know of uh, engineering, um, being a medical doctor, being a nurse or a teacher. So I was never really exposed to the um, sciences. So I grew up really always saying I want to be a doctor so that I can cure HIV and AIDS as well as cancer. So at that time also HIV and AIDS was a very big uh, trending topic which uh, was happening. So I thought, you know what, I'm in the field, if I want to go into medical, in the medical field, then um, it would be nice uh, to actually find a cure for all of these diseases that are um, currently burdening uh, human beings as well as health systems around the world. So that was always been my, you know, whenever you ask what you want to, to become and why, I would have said I want to be a doctor so I can find the cure for HIV and AIDS. So then again, I had a passion uh, which I did not know was a passion then of teaching. Uh, because uh, if you knew me growing up, you'd know that um, uh, I would always, I was always that guy who always wants to volunteer in class to give a lesson uh, in my house at home. Uh, I was always a teacher teaching my young siblings as well as my cousins. Uh, if you would walk into the house, you would see a uh, chalk everywhere. So I'd be writing on walls, I'd be writing on doors. So, so it's something that I knew uh, that I had a passion for, uh, but I never really thought that I would be a teacher. So it, it was really a mixture of uh, wanting to find cures for HIV and cancer and all of such, and also having this skill or this like or passion of always teaching, that like I'm teaching someone something, uh, either my siblings or I want to, to teach at school. I mean, it got to a point where I also used to hold afternoon classes uh, with my peers just so we can uh, get through some of the work. Uh, so, uh, going from there then, I had to, of course, uh, at the end of my metric, towards the end, apply for admission at a university. So as you may know that most of the health science faculties in most universities close the applications much earlier than the other faculties. So I missed the deadline to apply uh, to do a, a medical degree. So MBBCH, that's what they call it, efforts. So I missed that uh, deadline and I opted for BSc as my uh, second and uh, and my third choice was chemical engineering. So I got lucky that I passed uh, with the bachelor's entrance and I got accepted at Fitz University and that's where then I started uh, my BSc. Now I did this BSc in uh, biological sciences particular because I still had that um, idea of wanting to go into uh, medical 
um, work so I can find the cure for the diseases. So I went into this degree with the idea that when I'm done with the degree, I will still have an opportunity to switch over now to medical school and now do um, a medical degree. However, as I was doing the BSc in genetics uh, and biochemistry, I then realized that, oh my gosh, you know, this thing that I've been talking about as a young person, uh, that I want to find a cure for HIV and AIDS as well as cancer, it's actually not medical doctors who are behind the research, but rather scientists, uh, geneticists, biochemists, molecular biologists, bioinformaticists, as well as people who are in the area of biotechnology. So I realized that during uh, my BSc uh, at Vets, uh, and then I just had a switch <laughs> from from wanting to become a medical doctor and actually sticking to what I uh, have registered in. So following my uh, BSc, uh, which I finished in 2012, I then uh, got into honours uh, because uh, at that stage then we were advised that, you know, if you want to continue in this career field, you would have to pursue a postgraduate degree. Uh, I then went into honours and I did that at medical school, at Vets Medical School in association with the National Health Laboratory Service. I did a human genetics degree honours and there I was looking at the genetics of systemic lupus in African population. So lupus uh, is a disease where your um, cells that are supposed to protect you from infection, those are your white, white blood cells, then identify your own cells as foreign. So basically the body are taking itself. So there I was looking at what are the genetic uh, causes of, of this type of sickness. At the same time, also, I was a teaching assistant and a lab demonstrator in the schools of uh, education, as well as the molecular and cell biology school. So um, I did my honors in 2013 and finished it in 2013 uh, at the same university. And then the travel started. Now I had to move on to masters and, and coming from a background of where uh, parents at home are not exposed too much to career fields, especially uh, in the area of sciences, uh, where they believe that after one degree, you should be able to go out now and find a job and, and then start providing for a family. But I had to then, um, um, you know, tell my parents then that, you know what, this career field that I'm in uh, requires me to study further. And of course, being someone from a previously disadvantaged background uh, who couldn't also afford much of the university fees that was funded by NASFAS and other funders. So I, I, I had to sort of find a way to continue forward because usually NASFAS doesn't cover uh, postgraduate degrees and so on. So then uh, I got a job as a patrol attendant uh, just to raise enough money for me to register and get a place address. And then once I got that, then then everything else I would figure out for something. So I was a patrol attendant for about four months just to raise enough money for, for registration. I raised enough money, so I was able now to register for a master's. So now I went back to the School of Molecular and Cell Biology, where I did my BSc degree, and I was accepted for master's there to study uh, the genetic role of, I mean, um, excuse me, the gen genetic insights of chronic kidney disease in African populations. So I was still within the area of genetics, but then now looking at a different disease. So at that time as well, I was a teaching assistant and a lab demonstrator. And it was that time again when I was doing the teaching that I remembered uh, that I really enjoyed doing this as a young person in, in high school and so on. So this um, teaching assistant jobs that we used to do 
um, at university as part of our training then sparked again that interest that I always knew I had inside of me, but I didn't know uh, if I really wanted to end up being a teacher. I thought uh, I'm doing already genetics, so I'm in the area of basically drug discovery, which is what I wanted to do uh, in terms of medicine. But then now the teaching came in and and the more I taught, the more I, I, I I, I realized that actually this this is what I really want to do. I want to teach, but also I am really enjoying the area of drug discovery. So uh, that same year uh, in my MSc, I got awarded the uh, Teaching and Teaching Assistant Award by the Vets School of Molecular and Cell Biology Faculty of Science, and that sort of put a stamp into my. Um, what is it? Passion. It is sort of validated what what I, I I thought I had a passion for. So when when you get such an award where you are rated by uh, students as well as professors and colleagues, then you, you you it sort of gives you some sort of validation that you are probably in the right field. So there I was. I thought yes, this is you know validation. So this is what I should be doing. I should be teaching and I am also in the area of drug discovery. So I love that area. So I thought, yes, so then I should be teaching at university. So then at that point, then I made a decision that I'm going to apply uh, to teach at university. And just as I was writing up my <laughs> Masters, uh, FISMAS Fall started uh, in 2015, and it was a, a very <laughs> a tricky time, you know, trying to wrap up your masters and also uh, trying to see if there's a future. I applied for a job at VETS, and whilst I was writing up my masters, and I got appointed as a senior lab technician. So that role was still within the teaching atmosphere where I was teaching students in the labs directly. So fast forward from uh, 2015 when I was appointed. Uh, two years later, an opportunity arises at UNISA where they are looking for a lecturer in biotechnology that is on contract. So at VETS, I was a permanent uh, employee with all the benefits that come with being a permanent employee. But then when this opportunity arose, I thought to myself, you know what? Um, I love teaching and as much as a senior lab techno technician position gives me teaching opportunities, I'd like to interact more with students as that uh, is what I really enjoy. So then I thought, ah, there's an opportunity to be a lecturer. I then quit my permanent job, which was very risky, and went over to UNISA to start a contract on a lecturer position teaching biotechnology. So there in that position, which is currently what I am, uh, I am responsible for teaching uh, biotechnology and genetics modules, as well as the lab practicals. I am not only just a lecturer, as I've mentioned, I'm also doing my doctoral research in the area of drug discovery and development. Thank you, Sikusiso uh, Melindisa, I see is with us in the audience today. And I think what um, his story mirrors um, many of the stories that I hear from students that you have a certain career plan in mind or mapped out and then things are not um, as easy and smooth and one directional as you hoped it would be. Um, and that one is also influenced by one's context. Your career decisions are influenced by your context um, and the economy and the landscape of that time. And he was saying in the beginning of this career journey that there was limited career options. You either became a nurse or an educator. So science wasn't even an option for him. Um, but eventually, as time went on, his exposure to the sciences um, were increased. Um, and it seems also another thread that I want to, to latch on to is, um, he said, you know, in terms of funding as a NAFSA student, and thousands of our students are funded by NAFSA's, 
But what he says was that they didn't, they don't offer postgrad funding, so he had to become a petrol attendant. And I think I have a lot of conversations with students around um, finding meaning in your survival job. So I call these jobs survival jobs because they, we do them to survive, um, and they're not really attached to our our um, existing passions or, or career desires or plan, um, but how they do feed into one's long-term plan because one needs financial stability and one needs money to survive and to eat and to stay alive. So those survival jobs are so important to get us to where we want to be. And I like how the, the story goes between, you know, I I had to raise money, then I had to go back to connect and disconnectedness, but eventually getting to where he didn't think he would be, but where he, he is actually, where his passion lies. So um, PhD candidate and now also lecturing in the field of um, biotechnology and the PhD topic focusing on genetics. Um, and that he stayed true to himself throughout the process in terms of pursuing his career goals. Um, so thank you so much, Sibu uh, Siso, for sharing. Um, we had to cut the uh, recording a bit short, but the full recording will be distributed to the students who registered to attend the event today. Our next speaker on the program is Professor Ashley Gunter, also from UNISA Department of Geography. The topic is titled A Geographical Worldview. Hi everyone, my name is Professor Ashley Gunter and I'm a professor in the Department of Geography at UNISA and I was asked just to talk to you a little bit about geography and what I do and why geography is great. Um, and part of that I'd like to say is that uh, geographers come with a particular worldview way of looking at the world um, and and that is is something that's unique to geographers because uh, <laughs> very often you speak to a geographer and they say you can study everything because everything happens in geography geography is the study of space and place and obviously everything happens somewhere so it has to be geography but the particularly unique thing about geography is that when we look at place and sp when we look at anything we look at it where space that it happens is the important bit the place that it happens is important and that's why geography's worldview is quite uh, unique to the discipline um, and why the skill is often wanted by many people in different industries. Because as a geographer, you look at something and you say, why is the place that this is happening important? Um, so if you think of something like, you know, there's cities all around the world and cities kind of do the same thing. But when we look at buildings in a city, we say, why is the place that the city's in? So why is it these buildings are being built in this particular place rather than that particular place? And what makes them unique to this particular place? So if you think of a place that has earthquakes, for example, you build buildings in a different way than a place that doesn't have earthquakes. And the space that that is in, the earthquake issue, is what makes um, geography so important in that particular space. And so geographers almost look at everything in the world and, and you kind of know when you're a geographer. And, and in some ways, it's a, geographers are very proud of that. If you meet people who say, I'm a geographer, it's that they look at the world a little bit differently because they're saying, why is the, the geography of the space special here and not just the space special? So one of my particular areas of interest is geography and education. So as I just said, obviously, we're looking at this thing the issues of education from a geographical point of view. So it's really to start to unpack why is the space that education happens in important? And that goes back almost to some of the most fundamental ideas that we have around education. That, you know, when when universities and schools are the most prestigious ones always happen in a place that's very grand. And this is not done by accident. This is done on purpose. The original idea of education, it was something very grand. It, you know, the old ideas of education in this big establishment where the buildings were beautiful and everything was very impressive was important. It was a geographical concept because this idea that space is important when you learn. And, and we all feel that way. If you're studying somewhere grand, it makes you almost want to study harder, want to put more effort into it. And, and the spaces with grand educational institutions kind of unpack that. So geographers in education start to understand how does education get affected by geography? And this is very different to studying geography, which many of, you, many of you would know, but rather how does space affect geography? If you think about it, sometimes in rural areas, people have to travel very far to get to school. So then we start to unpack what are the issues in geography that affect these students who have to study far? 
does it make them tighter at the end of the day so their homework can't be done or is done with uh, low energy and someone who lives close to school that changes so then do we maybe target transports to get those students to school so the geography of education unpacks how education happens in a particular landscape and as i say some of those issues are around well, what does the school look like? Does it inspire, the space inspire students to want to work hard? And I mean, literally, if schools, and, and there's research to show this, if schools look tatty and, and be cared for and unloved, students don't care as much for their work, whereas schools look impressive and, and are well kept, and pupils do. And then it moves to what distance do students travel to school and what are the types of environments, even the climates um, that students have to, to travel through. Then uh, recently, a student of mine was looking at how uh, torrential rains in certain areas causes some students to not go to school on a particular day because it's too difficult to get there when it's raining very hard and it leads to um, a high percentage of absenteeism. So these things around education are quite important and um, when we're unpacking what do schools do and how do schools uh, relate to the geographical landscape, schools in, in urban areas and what are the, the ge geography of the spaces around them. Um, sometimes you even find a school in, an, in a high rise urban area doesn't have space for sports fields and um, lots of facilities and that influences the type of education a student might get. So that's why I say when when a geographer looks at the world, they look at it in a very specific way. They look at it in a, a way that that brings in those spatial factors, brings in the idea. It's not just that, you know, a school in a high rise area might have uh, high densities and it might be socioeconomic issues, but they're also geographical issues like space. If you go to that school and you want to, you know, have a large swimming pool or tennis courts or netball courts or, you know, running tracks and so on, they might not, might not be space for that. So how does that influence the way those students particularly use and feel like they're getting from that school? And so geography of education unpacks some of those issues around what are the, the spatial issues that affects education? My specific research within geographies of education, geography in general, is a geography of distance education. Uh, this started off, I think, from quite an interesting place because the idea that actually in distance education, geography becomes obsolete because a student sits somewhere and the university sits somewhere else and they, stay, you know, and they don't actually interact. You don't leave where you are to go study at a distance university like UNISA. You stay where you are. Um, but there's a lot of complicated geographical issues within this and some things like how does knowledge move across space? So in many universities, a student would decide they're going to that place, they leave home, which could be in another province or another country, move to somewhere where they're going to study. And um, in distance education, that student doesn't move, the knowledge moves. And this is done through a number of mediums, like you can get stuff over the internet, or you can get a pack, or you can get a textbook, and that information moves across space. But it's not as simple as just the knowledge moving, because lots of things happen when this knowledge moves. For example, if you are in a place with poor internet, the knowledge moving to you, if it's an online course, is not as easy as if you're in a place with good internet access. And so the, the, the networks that connect the university to the student, and these networks happen across space, become very important, even with postal systems. If you're sent a course pack or a library book, the network of the postal system that gets that a bit of information from the university to the student takes a, is a lot better or easier for the student to access that information. And many students and those of you that were studying at UNISA when they would post um, information across, many students would complain, oh, I haven't got my study material yet because it hasn't been posted and how am I going to study and so on. And so there were huge implications for having a poor postal network which is a geographical thing. How does the, that network move that information across space? But now with um, the internet, the same type of issues that if you have poor internet access, then it's going to be more difficult for you to get your study material from a UNISA type of institution, although electricity also falls into that. And so there's a theory in geography called actor network theory, how networks connect different actors to one another and the strength or the, um, the poor nature of those networks can have a huge influence on how um, different things interact with one another. And that's been taken into the geographies of education, specifically, as I said, distance education. So how does information move across these different networks that connect all these people to one another and all those things to the university? So if you think about it, we talk about an online course, okay? So we know knowledge has to move from the university to the student. 
And that happens in fairly strong networks thanks to internet connections and so on. Although sometimes if you're living in a university, if you live in a city, in an area with good internet access, that network's a lot stronger than in a rural area, for example. But there are also other networks in there because students connect to one another over WhatsApp, over telephone calls, sometimes meeting one another. We all know there are different student groups sometimes in a town who might meet up to study and so on. And so that network can be at a distance, that network can be a social network, it can be a face-to-face -face network, it can be a WhatsApp group network or a telegraph network. And so all these elements of um, networking come into place. How do students then access this knowledge? How do they disseminate it between one another? What are the side networks that take place that are not the formal relationship between the university? How do the things that, that the university can't control, for example, internet and electricity, the university has no control of them, but the student is hugely affected by this. Those of you writing online exams um, know exactly what it's like when the internet or the, the um, electricity is down during your exam. Now, the university cannot control for that. They can't control for every single load shedding schedule around the country, but it has a big impact on the way you see the university and the way that you um, access the university and and are um, influenced by by what the university looks like. And that changes the way we think about how a university should necessarily run. And again, this is geography um, within this particular aspect. So ed tech or education technology, which is a huge field of um, growth globally and in South Africa, education in technology, how does that change the way we already and, and I deal specifically in distance education, but this idea of ed tech um, is going through all levels of education. How is technology coming into education? How does it enhance education and also make education poorer? There are many examples of where technology starts to um, make education less accessible or, or less enjoyable, at least. And so ed tech is a part of this um, understanding that I look at in the field of geography. What technologies are students using or universities using to engage with one another? And how are those in technologies enhancing the learning experience? Um, so one of the papers that I've written is, is around WhatsApp and how students interact with one another over WhatsApp um, to enhance their learning. So they get all this material and then they don't know what what's going on necessarily and and they don't know who to contact and you know they email and they'll get responses that that they want and so on and therefore they find one another on WhatsApp and they start engaging on WhatsApp um, which is outside of the university system but a very important space and how that uh, WhatsApp is then used as a, a an educational technology that enhances the student's learning experience because without that they wouldn't have been able to ask a whole group of other students hey did you understand question two this is what i'm thinking what are you thinking hey did you read this and did you read that a lot of informal learning is happening on that particular technological platform that students are accessing but i ed tech moves into to a whole number of um, technologies and platforms um, moodle if those of you that have been around at unisa for a while I know that we recently changed our platform, our um, virtual learning environment, the VLE, from Sakai to Moodle. You might not have noticed, but uh, the, the university changed from, from one learning platform to another. And so the interface the student has with the university changes. And, you know, on one level, OK, the information is all there and it's kind of put in the same way. But on the other hand, there are differences between one virtual learning platform and another virtual learning platform. And how does a student think about these platforms as digital spaces? So again, that geography comes into this. It's not just any space. This is a digital space, a digital place that students are going to, that they're working in. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of individual platforms? How do students perceive the particular spaces they're going on? Does it work for them? Does it not work for them? How do academics design their courses around a digital platform? And this is something quite important because when you design a course that's printed and sent to a student in distance education, you design it in a certain way. When you change that course to a digital platform, do you change the design? And when you do, how does that change the way a student engages with that particular learning platform? And so these are all the things that I've been thinking about as a geographer, to try and understand what it is within this particular discipline and how place and space is so important in these learning environments and technology is now coming and changing the way that we we learn and the way we understand um, but this is all happening in a particular geographical space that's connected to other geographical spaces and so that's how i've been thinking about 
geography as a, a discipline within this within this in, in, uh, technological space. So that's kind of what I've been been thinking about as a, um, a geographer within these particular spaces. It's a geographical perspective on a problem that is being dealt with by many other areas. Um, and this is why I say geographers come with a particular worldview and are often very proud of their geographical worldview as space is important because, you know, issues of education and distance education are studied by people in education, people in sociology and development studies and so on. But the geographer brings a very unique perspective to this to say, well, what are the geographical elements to this? What is the, how is space influencing what's going on here? Because just saying you're a distance education student is, is a very different experience from a distance education student who lives in a rural area versus one who lives next door to UNISA, for example, in Sunnyside, and can literally walk up the road and be on UNISA campus. Yes, both are distance education students, but one has a very different experience to the other. And so that's where the geographer comes in place. They, they try to think about that, where it's other people might not. A, a educationalist might think, oh, just about distance education, sending the material over online, where the geographer says, wait, wait, there are different experiences for different students within this environment. And so that's, I, I think geography is very exciting because it, it doesn't only look at it in education, looks at it in almost any field that you want to talk about. And, and you'll find in geography, there's so many sub areas of geography, health geography, historical geography, political geography, economic geography, um, who actually the uh, two years ago, I think it was an economic geographer won a Nobel Prize for their work. And, um, you know, ecology, environmental studies, sustainability and so many areas seem to fit into this field of geography and it's because at every point it's through that geographical perspective that spatial perspective where am i looking at the world through what lens am i looking through so if you are thinking of something to to study and focus on i highly recommend geography thank you very much a very important topic indeed very uh, relevant topic um, the not only the geographic locations of our students and disbursement of our student, but also the online learning spaces and the influence of um, the digitalization of learning spaces, but also the access to um, computers, to facilities, to data connectivity um, and how your uh, specific geographic location can impact on your experience of being a distance learner. So I don't think there are any two students that are universities that have the exact same experience. I think everyone has their own unique experience uh, with UNISA, um, studying with UNISA, learning online na and navigating the, the online spaces so that they are able to achieve academic success. And so that is the hope for today is that we hoping to assist students to navigate these online spaces so they they know who to connect with and how to connect and engage in conversations around planning for the future careers not just obtaining that piece of paper that you get on, at the graduation ceremony we're wanting to take it one step further and get them thinking about uh, what are the planning needs to happen and what else do you need to put in place in order to lay a solid foundation um, from which you can launch. So uh, thank you so much, um, Professor Ashley Gunter, for that interesting topic. Um, we're coming, we've got two more presentations. Um, now we are going to watch a video by Sandra Maluleka from the Department of Agriculture and Animal Health. And her topic focuses on technical expertise as a PhD student at UNISA. It is just purely video based, so it's going to be very different to the other presentations. And I hope you enjoy uh, sharing her experiences with us.
such an interesting video. I um, when Ms. Malulika uh, indicated that she's a PhD student at UNISA, I read a bit about um, her field of expertise and she indicated that she works at the, she does a lot of her work based at the lab at uh, UNISA main campus. And I said, um, I don't think any of our students have even seen the lab or know that there's a lab, understand the, what happens in the lab. And so I said, make a little video about what you do in this laboratory of yours. And so that's what she did, sent us a video of protein analysis on food and feed samples. Not that I quite understand exactly what was even happening there, but just watching the process and everything that is involved, I think for students that are into, um, that are looking at careers in food studies and sampling and wanting to work in the labs, these are the kinds of things that you're going to be exposed to and this is the type of work and um, I think it's also good for students to have a realistic understanding of what will be expected of them. Um, either as a master's student, PhD candidate, or as a professional in the field and wanting to work in the lab. When you engage with students, you, you, you to check out, you know, what is their knowledge base? So what type of careers do you have in mind? Where do you see yourself working? And people say, oh, I think I want to work in a lab. It sounds very interesting. So I think with the conversations that we're having today and the videos and experiences that are shared today, I think we're able to share with students um, and create within them a solid understanding, um, realistic expectations in terms of what is expected of me as a future graduate in this field. Our final speaker for today is from the Western Cape, our trainee career guidance practitioner, Ms. Kimberly Hendricks, and she's going to be talking about exploring agricultural careers. Good day, everybody. I'm Kimberly Hendricks. I'm the TCGP at UNISA from the Western Cape region. I completed my undergrad degree in psychology in 2018. From there, I went on to pursuing an honors degree in psychology, and I completed that in 2021. So our topic for today will be careers in agriculture. So the senior counselor, Sonia Barnard and I attended the Youth Technology and Strategies for the Youth Talk at the Nampo Grain SA event. This talk slash discussion focused on the future success of any se sector in the digital age that is determined largely by its adoption of technology and the strategy for adapting to ever-changing variables within the agriculture sector. With that, it is also important to look at how youth are being integrated into the strategies for production, research and policies, who are the decision makers, the change makers, the flesh thinkers and the action takers, and how do we reimagine the whole sector for an often uncertain tomorrow? The aim of also attending this event was to gather information in hopes of compiling a resource for the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. This way, students who are considering pursuing a career in this field can explore various skills and job opportunities. So this is the table of contents, just showing you all what the presentation entails. So what is agriculture? Agriculture is the science and art of cultivation on the soil, raising crops and rearing livestock. Agricultural development refers to the efforts made to increase farm production in order to meet the growing demand of an increasing population. So this can be achieved by increasing the crop area, the number of crops grown, improving irrigation facilities, use of fertilizers, and high yielding variety of seeds. The ultimate aim of agriculture is then to increase food security. Then agriculture is also a primary activity. It includes grain crops, fruits, vegetables, flowers, and rearing of livestock. The primary activities here include all those connected with the extraction and production of natural resources. Agriculture, fishing, and gathering are also good examples of these. Then agriculture or farming can be looked at as a system 
the important inputs are then your seeds, your fertilizers, machinery, and labor. Um, some of the operations involved are plowing, sowing, irrigation, weeding, and harvesting. So here the outputs from the system will then include your crops, your wool, dairy, and poultry products. Then lastly, food supply chains connect heavily dependent on producers and consumers throughout the globe. Now we're moving on to what are the agricultural trends for South Africa. Point number one, the aim is to create opportunities for entrepreneurial farmers and creating a more efficient allocation of resources in agriculture. Number two, technological advancements have been identified to be a significant driver of agricultural growth. Point three, the use of chemicals such as synthetic fertilizers have contributed to the increase of productivity in the agricultural sector throughout the replenishment of nutrients in the soil. Point four, genetically modified crops have contributed to the development of agriculture, both in South Africa and beyond. Though there have been opposition to growing of the crops from some quarters of the South African farming community. Point five, the organization of farms is beneficial to the agricultural sector because it reduces labor costs and improves production efficiency as well as increasing crop income. Then point six, South Africa's per capita consumption of meat, milk and eggs have been increasing over the years. In response to the change on the demand side, more inputs are directed to the production of livestock, vegetables and fruit to keep up with the more diversified food demand, contributing to severe soil and water pollution from agricultural runoff and animal waste. Next, we have 12 agricultural digital tools. So the following are 12 amazing tools that will keep you all interested, invested, engaged and productive wherever you may find yourselves, either as an employee in this, of this institution or a student wanting to study agriculture. So firstly, we have agricultural statistical reports. Um, this tool keeps you updated with the price trends of beef, cattle in South Africa and land prices. The Agri-Workers Survey and Consensus Tool. This tool keeps you up to date with information on agri-workers in the Western Cape from all ages, gender to location and careers. Cape Farmer Mapper. This mapping tool was designed to assist with spatial information, queries and decision making in both the fields of agriculture and environment management. Carbon Footprint Calculator. This device will help you calculate what your personal and professional carbon footprint is and it also gives you tips on how to do better. Enterprise budgets. This helps by having a look at listings of all estimated gross income and expenses associated with specific enterprise to provide an estimate of its gross margin. Then lastly, finance for farmers tools. The core needs of any individual anywhere around the world are health and food security. Should you know of any farmers struggling to maintain their excessive expenses, um, they can then have a look at Alsenberg um, Production Economic Support, which will also be a website link that I will provide um, later on in the, um, during the presentation. So this is a short activity I've included before I go on to the next slide. What are you doing to reduce your carbon footprint? And I will allow you all a moment to use the chat function just to share tips and advice um, on how you are trying to reduce your carbon footprint. For those who are not familiar with what carbon footprint is, so carbon dioxide um, emissions associated with all the activities of a person or other entity, such as your buildings, corporations, countries, etc. Um, so this includes direct emissions, such as those that result from fossil fuel combustion in manufacturing, heating, 
and transportation, as well as emissions required to produce the electricity associated with goods and services consumed. So I will just give you all a few minutes um, just to share your tips and advice. Maybe for those who don't have ways on how to reduce their carbon footprint, maybe you can pick up some tips from the others. Okay, agricultural digital tools continued. Number seven, so that is a fruit look link. Um, this quick and easy tool gives you the opportunity to have web-based, real-time data-based on remote sensing data modeling for the Western Cape agricultural sector. The system is updated weekly with crop growth, moisture, and mineral data. Green Agri. This is the top one-stop portal for all farmers, researchers, private and non-governmental agencies interested in smart agricultural practices, such as supporting green farming practices, balancing farming and conservation needs, resource efficiency, and waste minimization. Smart Agri. The vision here is to lead the way to a climate resilient agricultural future for the Western Cape with a coordinated sector plan. Marketing in agri businesses or business. This is where you get all the information that is related to cooperative development and support, market analysis and market information. Smart Tech. Here you can access surveys and ostrich slaughter plan. A canola camera, such as, for example, an aerial view of yellow leaf coverage over an area. Then lastly, Western Cape Dam Levels. This smart app is to ensure that people know the current dam levels and emphasize the importance of water saving. So these apps are available on um, your Play Store that you can access on your phone um, or on your laptop. And most of these apps are free as well. Now we're moving on to agricultural plans for 2050. So providing sufficient food now and in the future, shift to healthier, more affordable and sustainable diets, making sure that agricultural productions become more environmentally sustainable and is resilient to environmental shocks, raising farmer incomes and creating more off-farm employment we needed in dominantly agricultural economies, avoid competition from bioenergy for food, crops and land, increase livestock and pasture productivity, then lastly, improve soil and water management. So while predictions can shed light on the future, we are still about 27 years away from 2050. Um, so a whole new generation of growers were on their way um, within this field will be farming um, mid-century and much will happen between now and then um, that we cannot yet predict. But if the past is a clue to the future, South African growers will continue to seek better ways to produce crops by embracing innovation. Who should consider a career in agriculture? Well, if you are interested in producing food in a sustainable way, thus responding to the challenges of food insecurity in rural urban areas, enjoy the detailed perspective needed to collect data, analyze it and make sense of it, strengthen monitoring data and knowledge management, as well as sharing lead strategic research regarding climate change in agriculture, aspire to become farmers or managers of commercial farmers. Then lastly, enjoy spending time in a lab, doing research and improving humankind's understanding on the subject by applying biosecurity measures to prevent foot and mouth disease in humans and animals. Now we have skills needed for when wanting to pursue a career in this field. An example of workplace skills employability skills. These are basic skills a person must have to succeed in any workplace. These skills also give you the ability to add value to a company. Scare skills. This then refers to those occupations in which there is a scarcity of qualified and experienced people currently or in the future, either because A, such skilled people are not available, or B, 
They are available, but do not meet the employment criteria. Then we have critical skills. These are your top up skills, which are required to improve performance within an occupation. So for those wondering how to obtain such skills, there are short skills courses, um, agricultural skills development, specifically aimed at that, which is then also offered at the Alsenberg Agricultural Training Institution. For those interested, I will also include a link to the booklet where you can find more information. Now we have qualifications offered at UNISA, okay? So there we have higher certificates. We have about three, so there's one in animal welfare, and then there's one in mathematics and statistics, as well as physical sciences, because there is a maths and physical sciences requirement as well for when wanting to pursue um, a qualification in agriculture. We've got a diploma, advanced diplomas, bachelor's degrees, postgraduate diplomas, master's degrees, and then doctoral degree. So for some degrees, job shadowing is compulsory. For example, veterinary science. However, even if it might not be compulsory to do job shadow or to job shadow, um, it is still a good idea to spend some time with someone practicing within your career field. And do not be scared to ask them questions. This is also known as informational interviewing. If this job does become your career, it is important to make the right choice now. Only you will be able to make this decision and determine which career will bring you joy. So just to give a little bit more information on the higher certificate, if students do not meet the admission requirements for a bachelor's degree, Students will then need to complete a high certificate, which will enable them to meet the minimum um, college specific requirements for the degree. Here's just a list of identifying opportunities using career research. So there's also a link to um, a brochure containing information on 50 career opportunities related to agriculture and this brochure entails the following, a description on what the career entails, a list of potential employment opportunities, a list of tertiary institutions where one could study, a list of some of the subjects and the themes you may study, an indication of the duration of the qualification, and then lastly, the general requirements you may likely need. And this is just a list of references um, of some um, articles that I managed to gather and other online sources for when compiling this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was from our intern, Ms. Kimberly Hendricks. Um, she put a lot of effort into putting her presentation together, um, laid a lot of groundwork, um, going to the Agricultural Expo um, with our senior counselor in order to expose herself to the field of agriculture and then putting this very informative presentation together that our, our students would benefit from. That was our um, final presentation for today. If any students have any questions or comments, you're welcome to put them in the chat function. You will also find the contact details of the student counselors in the chat function together with uh, the evaluation form so you can give us feedback on uh, further topics that you perhaps want to hear about or need support with. So um, with that, I'd just like to thank all of our speakers um, and presenters who put the recordings together and were willing to participate and engage with our students today. Um, thank you to our, our technical support, Mr. Mubashir Kabre, and the senior counselor, Ms. Sonia Barnard. Sonia, do you have any final or last words for our students? Thank you, Chantal. First of all, it was an interesting event, um, a wonderful way of broadening my general knowledge. There's such interesting work that takes a place and it's, such, it's so diverse in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Science. And I really hope that we in future work with more lecturers to collect career stories and to just also give a background of how they ended up in their PhD studies and what it entails because I think it's incredibly useful for students, as it was for myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, I wonder if there's anyone in the um, online space, anyone else that wants to um, share a comment, thought, concern, um, then you're welcome to do so now. And if not, then I will be closing the proceedings for today. Um, the students who registered to attend the event will receive the, the recording of the proceedings for today and we'll also have our contact details. So if you have any future questions or concerns, you're welcome to make contact with the counselling unit. So thank you very much to our students, our speakers and staff. With that, I close the programme for today. Goodbye.